I just want to continue with a seri on, on the series of Christianity Explored. Some of you uh, were born in church. You know everything that is being taught here. And perhaps you joined uh, church for the first time and you may not know anything about Christian uh, gospel or doctrine. Last five messages were about death and resurrection, the cross three times, and the resurrection twice. And none of that is our work. That's all God's work. If you could just look up here. Yeah, look up here. I'm going to wait for you. Yeah. We know Christianity is about God's work, but today I want to deal with what about your attitude? What is this supposed to be like? Oh, yeah, I agree with that. I, that sounds good. I'll take that. Is that good enough? And, and the answer is absolutely not. Okay? So what about your attitude? So today using uh, this famous uh, story of rich, young ruler, and some of you know this story, some of you don't. Uh, during Light of the Ministry, I share that me a message. But for those of you who are hearing for the first time, think with me. Do you know any rich, young, successful person? Do you know any? Okay. Anybody? Probably not. Okay. Those are three hard things to get. And that's what everybody in the world, not just Westerners, uh, but everybody in the world desires. Okay. Rich. You want to be rich. Right. And you want to stay young and healthy. And you want to be successful. And for one to have all three of them, it takes a little bit more than a luck, right? So with that as an introduction, uh, this person came and asked this stunning question. Listen to this question to, to Jesus. What must I do to inherit eternal life? What must I do to inherit eternal life? Hmm. Even with everything that the world is telling you to go after, and this person, I don't know how, but he had, had it all, but he had this uh, deep, empty heart, longing for eternity. You know why? You know why you do that? Because you are made to live for eternity. Okay? So with this message, I thought about I could go into two, two different directions. Okay? Since we, are, we already talked about cross and resurrection, and I wanted to talk about the topic of grace. I don't know whether you understand what that word means, grace. I mean, we say it all the time. And so many of you, are, you know, name grace, but grace. Or the other direction I want to I wanna go is, what about salvation and money? How does that work? You want to be rich, don't you? If you want to be honest. You know, that's why we work 60, 70 hours a week, 80 hours a week. doesn't matter, right? You want to be rich. So how does that work? Salvation and money and as opposed to grace. And I was really debating which directions to go to throughout this week. And I still couldn't make up my mind. Okay, so whatever the message that Lord allows me to deliver to you. But I think either direction we go, I think it will be very relevant to you. Okay, so let me, let me start with this title. With men, it is impossible. Could you look at the title? With men, it is impossible. What, what is impossible? What must I do to inherit eternal life? Who is saying this? God is saying this. With you, it's impossible. With you, it is impossible. That's what distinguishes Christianity from everything else. That's why we need grace. I hope you're getting the sense. Okay? If it is possible, you don't need grace. You just need sub supplements. You don't need grace. Okay? So let me begin with that statement. And uh, <clears throat> Titus 3, 7 says, Sola gratia, which means only by grace. Okay? Only by grace. It's not like you do 70% and 
30% grace. You do 90% and then 10% 10 grace. It's all grace. Okay? All grace. And I want to introduce a verse from the Old Testament, Jer Jeremiah 13. It's a peculiar place to talk about grace. But I think it is a good place to, uh, to begin, okay? Listen to this verse. This is what God is speaking to his people, okay? So interesting. Can the Ethiopian change his skin? Okay. Have you ever seen an Ethiopian? Okay. Uh, or a leopard, his spots. And obviously, the, uh, the, you know, those two questions in the Old Testament, answer is no. It's impossible, Right? And then it follows by God saying, then also you can do good who are accustomed to, to do evil. But that's an impossibility. But God is saying, you can. How? Right? Grace. Grace. You know, uh, I, I go to Africa pretty often for the last 14 years. And I've seen Ethiopians. Ethiopians are a little bit different than uh, East uh, Africans. Africans are, they look like Africans. But Ethiopians, they look something, somewhere between African and Middle Eastern people. They look a little bit different. But dark, obviously. And we see Ethiopian in the, in the Bible, right? In, in the book of Acts. So can an Ethiopian change his skin? And they were saying it's an impossibility. Right? Can the leopard remove uh, its spots? No. What about, we, uh, what about the human beings? Can we do good whom we are so accustomed to do evil? The Bible is saying, just as it is impossible for an uh, Ethiopian to change his skin, you cannot do good. But God can. Okay? Very interesting verse from uh, Jeremiah. Okay, let me just read it through one more time. If you just stay with me, and I highlighted some of the very uh, important uh, verses. So if you could just stay with me. Can I just orient you a little bit? Because it's easy to look at this uh, story out of context. But let me just give you the context again, okay? In Mark chapter 8, 9, 10, Jesus mentions about his suffering and death. Son of man must suffer and must go to Jerusalem and be captured by this religious people and mocked and sped on and beat up and be sold and be killed and this falls somewhere in between in fact Mark chapter 10 is very close to Jesus entering Jerusalem to be crucified do you, get, do you get the context? I think it's important that we get the context. You don't want to just take this out of context. Still good, but I think it's much better if you understand the flow and whereabout this story is happening. And this story of rich young ruler is important that it is written in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, which means it is important, okay? So let's look at this. <clears throat> As he was setting, on, setting out on his journey, a man ran up to knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, Rabbi, what must I do to inherit eternal life? By the way, the rabbis in that time, they always posed the question to the people, What must you do to inherit eternal life to, for, for you to listen to them? Okay? That's just the way they deliver. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And the answer for them was always one, always the same. You know what it is? Obey the law and do not sin. He already knew, but he came to Jesus and asked this question. Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Now right there is the message, right there. No one is good except God alone. Why do you call me good? He doesn't say, I'm not good. He doesn't say, ah, you know, what do you call me good? You know, he doesn't try to be, you know, uh, humble or anything like that, modest or anything. What do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Hint, right? You know the commandments. See, obey the law. 
right? You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not uh, bear false witnesses. And do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And this rich young ruler guy said, Teacher, Rabbi, all these I have kept from my youth. Right? Obey the law and do not sin. He already did that. And yet he still doesn't have that deep sense of security and confidence about his eternity. And my question to you is, do you have it? Really? Do you have it? Right? And Jesus, looking at him, and loved him. Okay? I want you to kind of like look at me and kind of like imagine Jesus looks at you lovingly. Of course he looks at you lovingly. He came because he loves you. And he's going to say what he's going to say because he loves you. Okay? And this is what he said to this rich, successful young guy. You know, you lack one thing, one thing, one thing. You did everything right. You did not kill anybody. You did not commit adultery. You did not give false testimony. You honor your mother and father. But you, let, you, you need one more thing. I think Jesus kind of give to him. You know, the truth of the matter is, we know from, uh, from the epistles that none of us could keep any of the law right. In fact, we don't even have the desire to do it right. We can't do it right. But Jesus... Okay, I give to you, but you just need lack one more thing. What is that one thing? Pretty, pretty significant thing. I want you to go and sell and all that you have and give to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. I love this verse. You know, many years ago, I was, you know, kind of like studying this verse. And I come across, there are five verbs. Go. Give, oh no, no, go sell and give and come and follow. Five verbs, but only one main verb. Which one is it? Follow me, right? The question was, what must I do have to do have eternal life? What must I do? Do. But Jesus said, follow me. Okay? Interesting uh, dynamic here. Salvation and uh, following Christ or discipleship, okay? I love to talk about this topic because people try to make a religion out of Christianity saying that once you, okay, once I receive Christ, that's it. I get the ticket. And yet you feel empty and you continue to live in sin and you hate it and you are confused. You have, tr you have to try really hard to justify yourself and you hate that. And you hate that. Nobody really loves that. Oh, it's a tough life. Life is a st struggle. It's supposed to be up and down. You always try to justify yourself. Aren't you tired of that? And you have no desire for Him. Right? And sin just continues to reign in your life. Right? So, follow me. And this is the verse I want to introduce. The last verse, believe it or not. Disheartened. Disheartened. By the same, okay? And the rich young ruler went away sorrowful, for he had a great position, a possession, position, possession. Okay, here's what I want to I want, I want to I want to ask you. What's the relationship between your uh, money and possession and salvation? Is there a relationship? I think so. I think so. Does this mean that it's an, it's an absolute law that you all have to be poor to follow Jesus? I don't think that's the point of the story. It may be to you, okay? It may be the case for you, but I don't think that's the, like universal law that you have all going to have to be poor, and that's the only way, to, uh, only way to follow Christ. I don't think so. But is there a relationship between possession and money, like possession and, and salvation? Okay? I think so. And the key word is sorrowful. Okay? Sorrowful. What does that word mean? Sorrowful means you feel so deeply sad. I looked up, okay, the word, meaning of the word. 
because you may lose the person or things that you treasure so much. Sorrowful. And this man was so close, so close. He came to Jesus seeking what he has to do to have, an, have an eternal life. And basically, Jesus gave him the answer. One thing, you, one more thing. I want you to go and sell and give to the poor, and you will have treasures in heaven and come and follow me. Right? So close. He had the formula. He knew what he had to do. But what happened? He walked away sad because of his great possession, and he was sorrowful. And he was sorrowful. Why? Because he was about to lose something that is so important to him. What is that? Great possession and money. Hmm. Oh, that's not my problem. I, first of all, I don't have the money. You know, you, most of you say, right, that's not my problem. I have no problem with that. That's why I'm, 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 I'm hoping that God would shine light upon your own heart right now. What would make you sorrowful if you were to lose something in your life? What would make you sorrowful? You know, the same word we find only four chapters later when Jesus was in Gethsemane. Jesus was sorrowful. Remember that? To the point of death. What was going on? Right? Same exact word is used in, in Mark chapter 10 with rich young ruler. And same exact word for uh, Jesus in Mark chapter 14. He was sorrowful to the point of death because Jesus was about to lose something, something that is so dear to him. You know what it is? The love of the Father that has continued for eternity. Just a few days ago, after Lola, we had a you know, love banquet, and my pastor passed away three months ago, and they've been married for 55 years. And the pastor's wife gave a testimony about uh, last four years where she was kind of taking care of him and he was in, you know, in bed, bedridden. And as, he, as she was sharing, I've never seen her. She's so energetic, but she was breaking down. And that's 55 years of marriage, 55 years of marriage, 55 years of good marriage, but not perfect marriage obviously. But for Jesus, it was eternity. And he was about to lose that. And he was about to experience not only he losing him, but he's going to turn around and pour his wrath upon him. Do you understand that? Can you, can you try to imagine this with me? Right? And he was feeling sorrowful. To the point of death. Wow, that's profound if you think about it. In other words, he was experiencing all it throughout eternity that was the loving relationship between Father and the Son. Now that's been disoriented, dislocated. He was experiencing complete disorientation, complete dislocation. Who am I? The meaning of life, the joy of my life. He was about to lose. He was about to lose the joy and the meaning of life. The very self, right? The love of his life. I'm losing the love of my life. My identity. My security. Security. He's the center of my being and I'm losing myself. That's what he was experiencing. Jesus was experiencing. And I know you may be thinking, oh, you're kind of pushing it. But... That's what he was experiencing, that he was losing what was to Jesus now, and the money was to him. Can I just ask you, how important is money to you? Seriously. Would you be so disoriented?
the love of my life, the joy of my life. I was thinking about this throughout this week, and what would, what would that look like? There are a lot of praise songs that was coming to my mind, and we sing songs like this. You are my world. You know that song? You are my world. Is Jesus your world, or is money your world? How do you know? You spend, you constantly think about it. Constantly uptight about it. Constantly focused about it through Monday through Saturday. And if that were to be taken away, you'll be sorrowful. Right? And another song. You are the reason that I live. I'm just asking you. Is Jesus or is money the reason that you live? You think this is a small one thing that he lacks? I don't think so, right? You know, <clears throat> the story continues and there are more difficult sayings. Okay, If you try to uh, kind of like put uh, money and salvation together, this is what Jesus said. Jesus looked around and said to disciples, how difficult it will be for those who are wealth, who are rich. You want to be rich? It'll be very difficult for you to be saved. Still want to be rich, right? It doesn't matter. I want to be rich. It's, it's difficult anyway. But Jesus specifically singles out, right? And he says, it is how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed. You know, they were astonished at his word. But Jesus said to them again, children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is difficult. You may, don't you try to make it easy. Don't you do that. Right? Ah, oh, it's nothing. No, you're making up your own religion. I think. And then he gives the example or the picture of how difficult it is. This is how easy or how difficult it is. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Can you imagine that? A camel? the largest creature in Palestine, okay? A, a camel to go through the eye of a needle, then for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. What is he saying? It is easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle, which is an impossibility, than the rich person to enter into the kingdom of God. You want to be rich, right? This is the view of God himself about possession and money and salvation. I hope, I hope you pay, pay attention. And then they were exceedingly astonished. Oh, they were troubled. And they said to, say, said to Jesus, then who then can be saved? Who can be saved? Who then can be saved? And Jesus says, looked at, uh, looked at, looked at them and said, with man it is impossible, but, with, uh, but not with God. All things are possible with God. I love this section. Oh, man. And I see grace in this section. What grace is? Who then can be saved? With man, it's impossible. You're rich, it's impossible. you poor, it's impossible. But not with God. All things are possible with God. What's going on here? Okay. Can I just ask you what goes on here? I don't know what your view of Christianity is and salvation is, money is. If you think that they're unrelated, then you're completely blind. Money is, money is not a living thing. I was thinking about this. Money is like a virus. There is no life in and, in and of itself. But if fit find the right host... It becomes a powerful thing. Right host. That was pretty good, right? Yeah. Right RNA stuff. Yeah. It's neutral, but it's dangerous. So dangerous that Jesus talks about money ten times more than about sex. Sexual sin is pretty bad throughout the scripture. But Jesus talks about in terms of a just sheer quantity, one to ten ratio, and warns you about money and possession. And you still want to be rich. 
Okay, what is going on? Okay, what in the world is going on? Can I just explain this? Uh, there is a historian named Andrew Walls. Okay, you could Google him. He teaches that uh, he's a British uh, historian. He talks about the center of religion of history. Okay, and he teaches at Princeton University. And this is what he kind of, uh, what, what, what he says. If you look at the center of religion, okay, for Islam, where would that be? It's pretty obvious. It's Mecca. Where is that? Saudi Arabia. Everybody going toward Mecca. Everybody, right? Everybody wants to go to that pilgrimage toward Mecca, and that still remains to be the center of Islam, Mecca. What about Buddhism? Buddhism is Far East. It has been and ha always has been. Now, here's, what he's, here's his argument. What about Christianity? Where is the center of Christianity? It definitely started in Jerusalem, right? Where the Pentecost, right? Christ, death and resurrection, birth of the church. But did it stay there? No, it did not. The center of Christianity moved in first and second and third century to where? To the Mediterranean world. It first moved to Alexandria, North Africa, right? And then moved to where? It moved to Rome, the center of the world, Roman world. Did it stay there? No, it did not stay there. What happened? It moved to sort of like barbaric region of northern European countries, like Franks and Irish and Celtics, which is the Germany and England. It moved to northern European countries for like hundreds of years, right? Did it stay there? No, it didn't. 18th and 19th century, it moved to North America, United States, 19th century, 20th century, Canada, North, Af Nor North America. What about last 100 years? Did it, is it staying here? A lot of historians saying, no, it's not. It's moving again. Moving to where? If you notice, Northern uh, Europe and North America is all, no, all Northern Hemisphere. The dominance of Christianity on Northern Hemisphere. But no longer. Most of rising Christianity is on the Southern Hemisphere now. South America, Africa, and Southeast Asia. Do you see it? It just constantly moved from Jerusalem to Alexandria to Rome to Vatican, to North, Northern uh, European countries, to United States. Now it's moving again. And people are saying, we're going to see something amazing happening in about 50 to 100 years, maybe, maybe 50 years. We're going to see missionaries moving from these third world countries coming toward white Christian countries like United States and Europe because they just don't have it anymore. What is going on? David Walls is proposing this. Okay? The central message of Christianity is the cross. Cross is about denying yourself and giving up your power. To the point where you, you're just undressed. You surrendered. Like a lamb. Cross is the central message of Christianity. And how would it work with power and money? Every time Christian message of sin and repentance and hell and heaven, Holy Spirit, kingdom, loving the poor, it's not going to receive well. You know why? Because your heart is full of possession and desire for possession and riches and power. So what happens? The Spirit of God just moves the center of Christianity from Jerusalem to Alexandria to Rome, always toward the periphery where the people are hungry and desperate and poor in spirit. That's, that's pretty good, isn't it? And I'm just 
sharing this with you because I don't know where your heart is. Can you look at your heart right now? Married or, or not, doesn't matter. I just want to ask you, what is sitting in the throne of your life? You are my world. What is the, who is, who makes up your world? It could easily be your own child. It could easily be your success ladder. It could easily be just a little bit of promotion. Oh, it makes me sad how foolish people live. Whereas the central message of Christianity is give up and deny yourself. Would it work? Salvation and money and power? It's not going to work. It's just not going to work. Friends, it's not going to work. Okay? Hmm. How difficult is it? It's impossible. It's impossible. With man, it is impossible. That's Christianity. With man, it is impossible. That's Christianity. Let me repeat it one more time. With man, it is impossible. That is Christianity. So only way we could have salvation is God pours His grace upon me. It's grace. Do you understand that? If you could just grasp that. If you could just grasp that. You just don't have it. You don't even want it. You oppose it. You know, reformists used to say irresistible grace. For those of you here for the first time, can you think of that word? Irresistible grace. Meaning opposite of resistible. The grace needs to be irresistible from God to you because we are so rotten and wicked that if we could resist the grace of God, we will. That's why it has to be irresistible grace. And I hope it gives you some sense of where human beings are, what grace means. Okay. Salvation and money and possession, are they related? Absolutely related. Okay. I just want to share one more thing. If I stop here and you just look at me here. You may say, oh yeah, okay, it's all by grace. It is all by God's work. It's all by death and resurrection. Okay, no problem. If you stop there, you're just a religious person. Hmm, isn't that, isn't that tough? Yeah, 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 it takes grace of God for you to come to that point. But Jesus is saying more. Please listen. This is what Jesus is saying. Okay, not only you have to turn, now you have to follow him. What does that mean? This is what it means. We're talking about rich, young ruler. Can I just ask you, who's the richest person in the world in history? And don't tell me Bill Gates. It's God. Right? Who is the ultimate ruler of the universe and history? It's Jesus. Sovereign Jesus. Rich 30-some-year-old ruler. He's the rich young ruler. The ultimate rich young ruler. Giving up his prerogatives and going to the cross for a dirt like you and me. And he's saying, follow me. Is that too much to ask? That's too much to ask? If you just stop there, okay, 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 I got it, I got it. It's all by grace, only by death and resurrection. If you stop there, you are being religious person. That means nothing. You know what you have to do? You have to follow him. And I don't think that's, that's a push. How do, you, how do I follow him? You use your money and possession for him. You use 
and money and possession for him. I don't know you, uh, most, uh, all of you, but I just assume that I have feeling that there isn't a really rich pe- person sitting here. I may be offending you, I'm sorry. You know, maybe I'm, mis- I'm you know, underestimating you. I don't think you are multi-millionaires sitting here. Okay? It doesn't matter. I never forget what Rick Warren spoke many years ago when I went to Saddleback Community Church for his conference in Southern California. You know, he's a multi-millionaire, and he never wanted to be a millionaire, mil, uh, you know, rich person. What happened was he wrote a journal for his church for 40 days of purpose. You know that book, right? It wasn't supposed, even, even supposed to be a book, just a journal for his church members. And he compiled it, and it became the bestseller. Right? And sold in 180 some countries. And it is still one of the top, you know, most bestseller in the world. And he's getting all these loyalties. And he's, he's so rich, so rich. And he's so popular. And I remember him saying these two things Lord, asking, asking the Lord, what do I do with this too? My money and my fame. And he finds the answer from the Psalms. Okay, he said, use that fame, which is, to, which is the influence, to magnify Christ. I think that's, that's good, right? What about the money? Just give it away. He said, it's not sin to become a rich person, but it is sin to die as a rich person. I just applaud inside of my heart. I applaud. I applaud. Is there a relationship between money, possession, and salvation? You better believe it. You better believe it. It's like virus. Neutral, but potent. Finding the right host. It'll become a deadly person. Deadly, de- deadly thing. Right? Deadly thing. With man, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. So the only thing we could really cling on to is the grace of God to a dirt like me. We're singing Great Grace. What was that song? Great Grace? I forgot. There's a line that says Great Grace. The more I think about it, it makes sense because for three reasons, Great Grace. Because God is so great as I get older. The second reason is because I began to see by grace of God that I'm a great sinner. And I'm not trying to be a modest here. And the third and the real reason is he gave up his riches and became poor so that I may be rich in Christ. Let's pray.